Almighty and ever-living God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and pleasing to you. Amen. Friends, I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. For those of you who do not yet know me, my name is Oli, and I'm from Singapore. I've been coming to St. Anne's for the past eight months. I'm a PhD student in Theological Studies at Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto, and I'm currently discerning a call to the priesthood. It has been a joy worshipping with all of you these months, and I feel very welcomed and spiritually centred here. I also want to thank Father Don for giving me an opportunity to preach today's sermon. These past couple of months have been trying ones for all of us here, not only at St. Anne's, but around the world. We are still in the midst of a global pandemic that has only just seemed to slow down a little, but that little positive turn in our global outlook has been marred by a senseless, senseless war in Europe with the invasion of Ukraine. Like many of you, I have been directly and personally affected by this war in Ukraine. Some of us know people in the country or have family members there struggling to survive during this dark period. Others who have Ukrainian heritage might feel devastated by the way the country has been portrayed as illegitimate and been imposed on by another superpower. Still, many of us who have little relations to the conflict have nonetheless experienced existential crisis arising out of it. To cite some examples, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow and all Russia, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, has blamed the war in Ukraine on pressure to accept gay pride parades, linking a deep political issue to something so unrelated, scapegoating an entire community of people in the process by blaming death and destruction on so-called sinners. Recently, in a political rally in Russia, President Putin even quoted from the Bible, John 15, 13 to be exact, in order to justify his invasion of Ukraine, supporting his political maneuver using a book seen as holy by Christians all around the world with no direct involvement in what is happening in the region. The effects of the war have a harrowing psychological impact on all of us. But it's the wider existential and spiritual issues like these which drive us to feel helplessness and affected by such faraway situations. They get us also to think about the presence of evil in the world, the philosophical and theological notions of right and wrong, and the rider repercussions these might have on us, despite us being relatively safe and cared for here in Toronto. Today's gospel passage reminds us that this existential dread and repercussive feelings indirectly faced by people when other communities are threatened and exterminated. This has been a deep humanitarian issue since the dawn of time. In today's passage, Jesus speaks to a crowd of his followers about the current affairs of his day. To give you some context, the events which Jesus speaks about is Pilate's execution of some Galileans during a ritual practice. This most probably affected Jesus and his followers just as the invasion of Ukraine has affected us today. Firstly, Jesus and his followers are Galileans or have some form of Galilean heritage themselves. Furthermore, Pilate represents the cruelty of the Roman Empire, a larger colonizing superpower imposing their rule on the land of Galilee. Pilate thus represents the face of brutality 
many other Galileans either directly or indirectly face during the Roman occupation. While historians and theologians alike note that there are no sources outside of Luke which record this particular tragic event, Jesus' response to the themes of the political and religious offer us a timeless and invaluable lesson. In his response to the crowd, Jesus does not center Pilate, but put the Galileans themselves up front. He questions if those who were killed were worse sinners than the people gathered before him that day, to which he firmly proclaims no. In doing this, he challenged the popular understanding of divine retribution of his day, which I have noted particularly in Patriarch Kirill's speech, ironically still occurs today. The actions of Pilate and by extension Rome were not synonymous with God's justice. Jesus parallels this with another contemporary event of the 18 killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. These were not a result of human sin or divine penalty. They were victims of events not of their own making. But in the instance of Pilate's violence, the political plays of power and control by those in authority. By saying this, Jesus indirectly encourages his audience to change what they can do about these awful situations when they feel helpless about them and in which they have no control over. He encourages them to repent about the way they perceive such situations as divine penalty and to change their minds about their commitments to injustice and unrighteousness by being compassionate and empathetic to those suffering. It is only through changing one's mind which can then lead to a changing in one's conduct. The reverberations of this mindset change would be far-reaching, encouraging a change in heart and then a change in discourse and action down the road as compassion is enabled in the way we see people and approach everyday issues. This would then lead to wider positive outcomes for future crises when we see and approach the other in our lives with compassion, empathy, justice and righteousness. The action of inner change is put forth in Jesus' parable of how the gardener advocates for the fig tree for one more year before being cut down. We are like the fig tree. If we do not change our mindsets and hearts, we are literally wasting the earth under our feet. Rather than focusing on the transgression of others, make sure we are producing good fruit cultivating the inner and personal fruits of compassion, understanding and love is the best strategy in affecting a wider and even global change which can prevent future calamities from occurring or encourage the preservation through unexpected ones. Let me situate Jesus' lesson from today's Gospel reading to a personal story. So I come from a country which, unlike Canada, is not very friendly to the LGBTQ community. We have a colonial era law which still criminalizes the private conceptual encounters between adult men. While the government has given reassurances that they would not use this law to persecute gay men, they have refused to repeal the law. This has caused much anxiety amongst the LGBTQ community and its existential impacts on mental and sexual health, identity and belonging have been far-reaching. The government's official explanation to keep the law while not actively using it was to strike a balance between more conservative groups in the country and the LGBT community and their allies. This was done in all actuality to pacify these conservative groups many of which are Christian groups and churches, who see the LGBT community as inherently deviant and who even encourage conversion therapy for LGBTQ persons. Because of this, many in the LGBT com LGBTQ community, much less queer Christians, have felt deeply hurt and abandoned by the church. The church I attend in Singapore, Free Community Church, is the one and only progressive church in the whole country 
which outwardly affirms the holiness of LGBTQ persons and encourages them to ministry. It was the church which first affirmed my call to ministry by sending me to theology school abroad. Many in Singapore who are skeptical and wary of the institutional church visit Free Community Church to seek answers for the many questions they have. The current pastor of the church, Reverend Miak Siu, a gay man himself, recalled an incident many years ago in which a transgender woman, who was a former sex worker, approached him. She asked him, A pastor of another church said I would go to hell. What do you say? In that moment, he was taken aback and was trying to formulate a theological answer to the question posed to him. At this very moment, my late mentor and pastoral advisor of the church, the Reverend Dr. Yap Kim Hao, appeared. He was an older straight man in his 80s, married with children and grandchildren. What's more impressive with Reverend Yap was that he was the former bishop of the Methodist Church in Singapore and the first high-ranking institutional church leader to come out in support of the LGBTQ community. Because of that, he was shunned by his former colleagues and friends in the mainstream church. The institutional church did not want anything to do with him, and this push made him come to serve at Free Community Church. The transgender woman, upon seeing Reverend Yap, turned to him and asked the same question. A pastor of another church said I would go to hell. What do you say? Reverend Yap chuckled, and in his deep, resonating voice said, Where you go, I will go. Where you go, I will go. In that very moment, Reverend Yap combined his destiny with hers. He linked his own humanity and spirituality to hers. It was a transformative moment where hearts and minds present in that very conversation were changed. He did not say anything about the pastor who mentioned about the woman going to hell. He, like Jesus in the gospel, addressed the people there directly to forget about transgressions of others, but to focus on producing good inner fruit. The repercussion of that conversation was wider, had wider impacts and five years after Reverend Yap's passing, the incident is still spoken about in both the Singaporean LGBTQ community and in Free Community Church today. It galvanized LGBTQ Christians and their straight allies to keep the faith and to see that by producing good fruit, we can change the hearts and minds of others which would lead to bigger changes in the future. To me, St. Anne's has helped me and many others to bear this same fruit of compassion and empathy. I was moved by our community here, especially in creating a space of solace for those directly and indirectly impacted by the war in Ukraine. I was moved when I attended the vigil a few weeks back and how it even attracted members of other religious groups who came for prayer and to express solidarity. I was moved as members of the congregation worked hard to welcome refugees into our church and to stand for the LGBTQ community by celebrating same-sex marriages. I was moved by your observance of Black History Month and the introducing of Jamaican culture through Coffee Hour a few Sundays ago. These are the little things we do which bear much fruit in the wider community. These little words and actions, which although are so far removed from actual calamities around the world, causes us to change our mindsets and hearts and to bear fruits of compassion, justice, and righteousness. We need not focus on the transgressions of others out there, but on showing compassion to those around us. I pray that we, as a congregation, continue to be the salt and the light of the world in this sense. And may we live true to our call at the dismissal, 
to go in peace, to love and serve the Lord and each other. Amen.